Welcome to this Bible Center Church Core Class. We hope that this in-depth teaching of God's Word will challenge you to grow in your knowledge of Him and help you become a disciple who makes more disciples. Hi, I'm Pastor Mike Graham, and welcome to our 201 level core classes. These core classes exist, and the goal of them is to kind of assist the rollout of the membership statement of faith. Matt will be preaching on those on Sundays, and then throughout the week, we're gonna have multiple core classes coming out that'll be 20 minutes or less. Really easy to listen to. They'll come out in a video form. They'll also come out in podcasts. Uh, it'll be really easy for you to follow along almost every day as we go a little bit deeper into the subject matter that Matt brings out on Sundays. Uh, as you go and look at the materials, there's a place where you can click and download the content so that you can physically look at the material as you listen to me discussing it and teaching it. We could even print it out for you. So there is material available for purchase. You'll see a, a way to click on your screen to do that. And for 10 bucks, you can buy our, our entire material, which is a good size book of our 201 level classes if you'd like to take notes as we go through. Uh, so that's an option for you. So we're going to jump in today, and the material we're going through for the next couple is brand new material. Our doctrinal statement, our membership statement of faith, starts with who the Bible, you know, about the Bible, then who God is, but the end of it is a section on unity. Instead of having that be at the end, we're going to bring that to the front. So if you listen to Matt's sermon on Sunday, he just taught on unity. So we're going to go a little bit deeper into unity, a subject that I haven't taught yet, but I'm looking forward to doing so with you over the next couple sessions together. So our first topic is Christian unity. I would suggest to you that Christian unity, um, the idea of being deeply connected to one another, it's not in response to some weird 1970s hippie song. It's really rooted in the deep theology, rooted in scripture, and in who God himself is. So let me first start by reading what the Membership Statement of Faith says under unity, and we're going to jump into some scripture talking more about it. It says this, As the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have enjoyed eternal community with one another, God invites all believers to make every effort to preserve the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There's three major things that connect here that teach us about the importance of unity. One, God is unified in Himself. Two, God has unified us to him. And three, God has called us to be unified to one another. So that'll be our outline for the next several minutes together. Uh, first, God is unified in himself. God experiences perfect unity and perfect community. Here's a couple cool verses. One, John 14, 11 says this. Jesus says, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Those words are not something that we truly understand. Maybe the closest example is we, that we have is a married couple. But Jesus is in the Father, and the Father is in the Son. There's deep, perfect community and unity within the Trinity. John chapter 14, verse 10 says, Jesus saying, The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his work. So as Jesus lived on earth, as he spoke, as he did miracles, he just recognized that it was the Father in him working through him. Again, there's this picture of this incredible unity and community within the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then kind of the icing on the cake is in John chapter 10, verse 30. Jesus simply says, I and the Father are one. He doesn't qualify the word one, just in every way you can think of, every way you can imagine, he and the Father are one. So they experience perfect unity, perfect community. Also, they have enjoyable community. We would say that they enjoy one another. There's some thought that I've heard out there where people think that God created out of boredom, almost like he needed something to play with or someone to talk to. Uh, there's a picture of an old man sitting on a log, stroking his beard, thinking, what am I going to do with the rest of eternity? That is not at all the picture that we're given in scripture of God, who is three in one. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, it says this, The Father speaks out loud concerning Jesus, and he says, This is my beloved Son, of whom I am well pleased. When the Father looks at the Son, he says, He is my beloved. When the Father looks at Jesus, he says, I am well pleased. There's joy, there's enjoyment in the community within the Trinity. 
This has existed for all of eternity. The Father has always been well pleased in the Son. He's always looked at Jesus and said, Oh, you are my beloved. When you look at John chapter 14, verse 31, Jesus says, But so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father has commanded me. So the fact that Jesus lived his entire life doing all that the Father has commanded him to do, it's a sign uh, to the world that he deeply loves the Father. So for all of eternity, Jesus has deeply loved the Father. The Son has loved the Father. So we see this incredible, enjoyable community. In my mind, it's like a picture of me and some of my closest friends going to my favorite restaurant and just enjoying food together. And the more time we spend together, the more we laugh, the deeper we get into conversation, and we enjoy each other more and more and more over time. That is the type of community that is described between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which leads to the next point. They have an overflowing community. So it's a perfect community. It's an enjoyable community. And then it's an overflowing community. God didn't create out of boredom. God didn't create out of lack. He actually created as an overflow of his love. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit love each other so much and enjoy each other so much that they created out of abundance, not out of loneliness. In John chapter 16, verse 15, this is an interesting verse. Uh, Jesus says, all things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he, the Spirit, takes mine and discloses it to you. That's not an easy verse, but what he's saying is this, is that the Spirit gives us what he received from Jesus, the Son, and the Son gives the Spirit what he received from the Father. So there's this incredible overflow where the Father gives the Son. The Spirit then takes from the Son and gives to us. So there's this natural overflow that takes place, and we see it in our lives, we see it in the way Jesus does ministry, and we see it in the work of the Holy Spirit every single day in our life. So God himself is united. God has also united us to him through Jesus. There's several verses about this. We could spend a lot of time on this. I just want to give you a few. One, we have been justified as though we have never sinned. God puts us in a position we are, where we are reconciled to God the Father. We have been given complete and total peace with him. There's nothing that stands in the way of us having a perfect, completely united relationship with God himself. He goes on to say that we're adopted. In John chapter 1 verse 12 and Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5, we are called the adopted children of God. There's nothing that stops my son and my daughter from being completely united to me as part of my family. There's nothing that stops you or I from being completely united to God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit in his family. The Bible goes on to say that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit that part of who the triune God is lives inside of those who believe, again, uniting us to God himself. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9 says this, God is faithful, through whom you were called into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ. We were called into fellowship, communion, community with Jesus. We live life in community with him. So God is united in himself. God has united us to him, through Jesus. Third major point, God has called us and commanded us to be united to one another. This should be no surprise. If the Trinity is united and we've been united to him, he would call us then to be united to one another. That same peace that we experience with God, we're called to then give and experience with one another, our brothers and sisters in Christ, as adopted children of God himself. We are unified in Christ and our unity reflects the unity of the Trinity. Our unity together as brothers and sisters actually biblically reflects the unity of God himself. John chapter 17, verse 11, the second part of the verse says this. Jesus is praying. He says, Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you've given me. Why? That they may be one, even as we are one. So what we see there is we see a comparison that our unity should, and I don't know how this is possible, only by the work of God, our unity should look like the unity of God. The quality of our unity together should be like that of the Trinity, that they may be one even as, in comparison to, just like, 
the unity that the Father and the Son have. So that's what we're called to, to share a unity that is of the same quality and nature of God himself. And of course, that only happens through the power and work of God, but that's what we're called to. And when we do that, our unity reflects the unity of God himself. And there should be no barriers to this. There's no ethnic barriers to this. There's no cultural barriers to this. There's no economic barriers to this. If you know Jesus, regardless of your station in life, your culture, your background, you are to be completely unified to everyone else who also believes in Christ. Even if your storyline, your background is completely different than theirs, unity is the call. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. We won't read the whole section, but the whole section talks about the importance of unity. It says there that you and I as Christians, we don't create unity. In fact, what the verse says there is that we are called to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That same phrase lands into our membership statement of faith. We're called to preserve the unity of the Spirit. Because we all have the Spirit, we've already been given unity. And the only reason why we don't have it or experience it is because we've broken it. So the call there isn't to create unity, to make unity, is to preserve the unity that we've already been given through or in the bond of peace. That my highest commitment is peace with my brother and sister. Not getting things done my way, in my timing, my persuasions, my opinions, but rather my highest call is to have a bond of peace and unity with my brother and sister. It also says in those verses that we are unified around the foundations of the faith. It goes on to say that we have one body, one spirit, one faith, one baptism, one God, and one Father of all. So that call there is around the basics of the faith, the essentials of the faith, which we're gonna, we're gonna talk about more and more in the membership statement of faith, but our call is to be unified around those things. So we are unified in Christ, reflecting the Trinity. We're unified by the Spirit. We're also unified for the sake of the body. If we had time, I would walk you through the entire book of First. That's 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians is a book where they've experienced huge division. The division has happened because of a couple things. One, there's mind-boggling sin. I mean, they have fallen into incredible sin and it's causing disunity. Also, there's divisions over spiritual gifts, liberty of con conscience, and communion. They're arguing over how to do some of those things. They have different persuasions and opinions. Those things aren't the key foundational doctrines of the faith, they're kind of how we live out our faith, but because they're disagreeing there, they're experiencing division. So Paul starts the letter by saying out loud, now I exhort you brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind, same body, and same judgment. So Paul calls them to, to stop being divided and to start being united. And then he works through all their different struggles that they're going through. By the time you get to the end of the letter, so he starts the letter saying, don't be divided. He ends the letter by giving them clarity on how to be united. In chapter 15, verses 3 and 4 of 1 Corinthians, he says this, For I delivered to you, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So there's a lot of things that they're dividing over, that they're arguing over, where divisions are taking place. He says, get back to the thing that is of first importance. What is the thing of first importance? Well, it's the gospel itself. It's who Jesus is. It's what he's accomplished in the fact that he raised from the dead and is sitting next to the Father himself. So even for you and I, when we're struggling with preserving unity, the question is, what is our highest priority. Paul reminds them and Paul reminds us, get back to the things of first importance. The things of first importance is being centered around the gospel, the gospel itself. So we're called back to that essential thing. So we're called to be united for the sake of the body. We're also called to be united for the sake of the world. In John 17 verses 22 and 23, it says this, Jesus is praying. He says, the glory which you have given me. So he's talking to the Father. Father, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in you, in me, that they may be in perfect unity. Why? So that the world may know that you sent me and love them, even as you have loved me. 
when you and I are unified, the Bible says that that communicates to the world that God the Father has sent Jesus. It communicates to the world that God loves us and God loves them. Without unity, we undermine the reality of God sending Jesus to the watching world. To the watching world, we undermine the concept or the idea that God actually loves us or loves them. So when our unity falls apart, when divisions take over, when arguments come to the forefront, we crush what the watching world so desperately needs to see. People who are loved by God, who are enjoying a Savior who was sent by God, and then are unified around the love that he showed us. So for the sake of the world, we're called to unity. A point of application. Where do you, where do you go from here? Jesus says it very plainly in John chapter 15, verses 12 and 13. He says this, This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down his life for his friends. There's a point earlier where Jesus says, love others as you love yourself. Some of you aren't real great at loving yourself. Here he takes it up a notch. He says, love others as I have loved you. When Jesus loved us, he gave up everything. All, I mean, there wasn't, he didn't have a pillow to put his head on. He had no like worldly treasures. Jesus gave up absolutely everything, endured incredible pain for you and I to clearly demonstrate his incredible love for us. That's the standard that he gives for you and me. If you and I commit ourselves to that standard, that we love one another more than we love ourselves, that my concern isn't making sure I get things my way or I win the argument, rather I just give up everything for the sake of others like Jesus did for me, when that happens, you'll be amazed how unified we become. So that's the call today, is love one another as Jesus has loved you. If we are called to lay down our lives for one another, please be willing to lay down your opinion, lay down your persuasion, lay down your personal goals for the sake of seeing other people deeply loved in Jesus, for the sake of the body, for the sake of the watching world. I'll see you next time as we continue to talk more about unity.